this is Scott the Bigfoot Explorer. How are you guys doing today? Welcome. And on today's video, we have an awesome interview, and that is from someone that needs no introduction into the Bigfoot realm. Uh, you've probably heard his, his encounter around YouTube, and that guest is Mr. Mike Woolley of uh, North Louisiana. Um, I was fortunate enough to to get in touch with Mike, and we spent about two or three months chatting back and forth. And uh, Mike is a great guy, uh, very honest, very humble man. Um, we both hit it off very well. Um, so he agreed to do the interview. So myself and Fernando uh, went up this past weekend, and we just decided uh, there has been multiple videos and radio shows done about Mike, Mike's encounter. Um, I will leave a link to one of those in the description below uh, if you haven't heard it or would like to just... Uh, brush up on his encounter. But the interview that we that you're gonna see is not necessarily related to his encounter, but rather uh, we decided to call it an evening with Mike Woolley and just chat about the state of affairs with Bigfoot here today in twenty nineteen. Also go back in Mike's past and see some of those things um, that he has to talk about and share uh, that led to his journey along the way. And, and he's, uh, he's in his mid sixties now and, uh, his journey is still, still ongoing. So it was a great interview. Guys, remember that, uh, we are not professional on the interviewers. I promise we will get better at it though. So hang in there and, uh, let's watch the an evening with Mike Woolley. So we turned on the camera now, and now we're. And of course, it's different. On. It feels different. And uh, well, we don't want it to be. And we don't want it to be. Yeah, but look, let's start here. Let's start about that one thing that you talked about that intrigued us the most, and where it began when your dad took you. I uh, started going in the woods with my dad. He was a squirrel hunter. He didn't deer hunt. But he still loved squirrel hunting. Yeah. About four years old, you know. I'd be tugging, you know, behind him, holding on. And uh, my love for hunting just bloomed, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I really wasn't, squirrel hunting was okay, but I like deer, you know, I like the yeah. big stuff, you know. And so they didn't really turn me loose with a gun until I was about yeah. 14 years old. He said, yeah, I gotta know. You know, I give it a little single barrel 20 gauge, you know, and that's what I deer hunted with. Got some slugs, you know, back then, and three or four cents of slug, you know, back in the early 70s, or 70, 1970. And uh, I started hunting, mostly by myself, you know. I went through a lot of hunting buddies, but, you know, some of them were very deadly. You know, you point a gun at me, and, you know, I don't play that. If you're careless with a gun, you're not going to hunt with me. And this is up in Louisiana, right. near where you live right. now. Right, today. right. I've hunted all over northwest Louisiana and, and Texas and all, you know, around. But uh, it just uh, it, it just bloomed, and, and, and you know, the hunting was my thing. I loved it. I mean, I lived to deer hunt. You right. know, uh, I respected it. You know, the, the, the game, and uh, you know, I, uh, I respected the law, mm -hmm. and I, I tried to get along with everybody. Uh, you know. And uh, it was really you know, a big thing in my life and something I really enjoyed. I mean, it was just, you know, it, it kind of, you know, how it is going to work every day, the grind and everything like that, you know. I had that to look forward to. My hunting, right, right. It kind of got my mind off the everyday crap. It's a recharge. Recharge, right. Yeah. Correct, yeah. correct, correct. So did y'all, did something happen? Like when was the first time that what, how were you before Bigfoot, before your awareness of Bigfoot? Well, I never believed in it because, you know, I've been in the woods 50 something years of my life. I've, I've seen a lot of stuff and, and, and a lot of stuff I've seen I wouldn't come back and tell nobody because it just, to me, it was unbelievable, mm -hmm. you know. 
this plant I worked on, I worked on a large factory and uh, I seen stuff in that plant, you know, people would just have breakdowns, lose their minds, stuff like that, and all kind of weird stuff would happen. And uh, I'd come home and I'd tell my friend, they said, no, that, no way, that didn't happen. You know, that, it was unbelievable. In the same way out there, and I just, you know, keep to myself. You right. Know? And uh, uh, because, you know, if, if a person got to where they was a hunter, which is what I did, and, and if they were a liar, okay, uh, you, you killed your uh, credibility with me. I took that serious. If I told you I killed 18 point buck, I killed 18 point buck. Right. You know, uh, I've, got the, I've got the racks lined up at the house, all the way up to 20s, you know, big racks. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my thing. Uh, be honest, just be yourself and be honest. I have walked seven miles. I parked my truck, and, and way back then we didn't have four wheelers, we didn't have three wheelers, we didn't have none of that. And you know, I parked my truck and uh, uh, walked in six, seven miles. Been stuck before and walked out ten miles in the dark without a flashlight. Oh, uh, right, right. Oh, you know, because that's how it goes. You know, and, and I, I, I bought a new truck one time in '78, and I, I went hunting. It's a really nice truck, and uh, I'll never forget, uh, when I went in, I always checked the tire tracks to mm -hmm. see if anybody's in there. Else, yeah. Yeah. Well, when I got back to my truck, <clears throat> it was piled up. Somebody had piled a bed full of uh, limbs, and there was limbs all over the hood. And there wasn't no tracks coming in. Nobody had been in there. And and that was the time, that, that was in... Uh, 1978, mm -hmm. November 78, there see my truck brand new, I just bought it. And it kind of got me upset, you know, and I got mm -hmm. to looking for tracks, you know, around, I couldn't see no human tracks, none of that. And uh, that kind of got me thinking because, you know, I, I would go in and I, I always walk back. I'd walk a mile or two. I wouldn't drive back to my deer stand. Right, scared not, the not to scare the deer, right. right. And, and I would have something following me, my pedal, mm -hmm. my pedal. You know, I hear it out there in the woods, and I'd look, I'd look, look, I didn't see nothing, I'd, you know, and follow me out, you know, and that kind of, uh, it irritated me. But your mind never really went to, this is Bigfoot. No. I had that rifle, and I always thought that, you know, the, the white-tailed deer or the panthers was king of the woods, but I also said, you know, I'm king of the woods, too, because of the point I'm holding. Right. But, uh, no, it never went to Bigfoot. Never, I, you know. I so you just chalk that up to just something in the woods, right? Uh, you know, I heard about the Patterson Gimlin when I was twelve years old. Yeah. I heard my parents and my uncle and all I'm talking about. It, but I said that's Hollywood. That's something. And they said that. They said that's Hollywood. They're just trying to make a buck. That's what I believe. But I hadn't yeah. seen nothing, you know. Right. And 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 uh, you know, no, I never believed in Bigfoot. I'm I know how it feels to walk with a rifle and they had that feed you back and kind of bolster you up, make you stand tall. And if you're very skilled with that rifle, you should stand tall. Yeah. How do you feel now about having a rifle and not just because of your own experience, but your knowledge of Bigfoot, these creatures, and what does that rifle speak to you now in terms of what confidence that you should hold up? I'll give you a good example. Yes. When I was hunting that day, I had a 270. Correct. One of the finest deer rifles around. Uh, she's a 130 grain bullet, which is not a big bullet, but it's a good flat shooting bullet. Kill mm -hmm. a lot of deer with it. Uh, he, uh, that creature made me uh, feel like I had a BB gun. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm getting ready. Uh, hopefully, near, I'm going to go elk hunting, start elk hunting. And I found this rifle. Uh, down at a dealership in Houston, Texas, where they have rifles from way back when you were a kid, kid, and they had the gun was brand new, and so I bought a 300 Magnum. I said, this time when I go, you know, yeah. it ain't gonna be no little 270s and 30 out sixes. I got a 300 Magnum BAR, right, right. Something that's you know shooting some pretty good lead if I have to, because you know that's what I happened that day. I had a seven millimeter Magnum and and it make that 270. Look like a BB gun, right? right. Categorical I mean, difference. It's just, I mean, uh, you know, I set targets up. A friend one day we were shooting, and we were shooting at a hundred yards, and he shot my 270 at a, a, a tree, shooting a target, 
and I hear the bullet, you know, but when he shot that seven mag, it was just, and then pow. Yeah. That yeah. bullet hit, and it went out the back of a tree. The tree right. was that big around. He went, now, that impressed the heck out of me. Right. And, and and it's always come down to it, you know, what would I have done if I'd had that seven mag that day? Mm -hmm. I don't know if he could have intimidated me as bad, you know. And so that's why I bought this big caliber rock with this 300 magnum. And that's what you had now. Yeah. So when I do the whale hunting, mm -hmm. I'll be toting that. Right. You know. So talk a little bit about, um, you know, your sighting or your encounter happened when you were how old? About 26. So let's start. What? How long before you came out, and then progress a little bit into, you know, uh, uh, once you did come out with it, um, where that happened, um, and 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 what and what you think of Bigfoot issues here today in 2019 compared to when this all happened. Well, it happened in 1981, and it happened uh, near Manny, Louisiana, about four miles north of Manny. But it hunted in the Louisiana Game Reserve, and y'all have them too down there, the Game Reserve. Was that Sabine Wildlife Management Sabine, that's area? It, that's it. Yeah. You just look at Manny on the map, right, and get on 171 north, four miles, and you'll see the Game Reserve right there on the left. It happened sure. right there on the left. Well, uh, when that happened, I, I really didn't know what to think. Uh, I didn't know if there was an omen. I lived years ago thinking it was an omen handed down to me. Like, I thought, you know, man, I ain't never really stole nothing. I ain't done nothing bad. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, why does it happen to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And at nighttime, I couldn't have the windows or the open or the blinds said to be shut, you know? And, and it was just, uh, it took 20 years. And back then there was no computers, there was no internet, there was mm -hmm. no cell phones, there was nothing. And you know, the, the newspapers and the little local papers, you know, if you'd have went to them, they wouldn't have put it in there. Yeah. They'd have just laughed at you. And you know, and you had to be careful around the college because it, it'd take you to a mental institution. Looney bin, yeah. 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 And uh, so, the only reason I come out with it uh, around 99 is several shows uh, come out. And uh, one of them was Mysterious Encounters. I don't know if you remember that. Autumn Williams. Yes. The blonde headed girl. Me and yes. her were good friends, by the way. Uh, and we've talked a lot. I was a kid. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, it, it kind of gave me the courage. Yeah. Like everybody's on TV, hunt, you know, telling them what's happened to them. You know, and I, I'm sitting there, you know, I can attest to that. Right. Mm -hmm. Why, yeah. why can't I do it too? You know, and so. You know, it, it, it was kind of like a, a, a therapy to get it off my, to get it out of my system. Yeah. It was like I was carrying a disease, like I had cancer or something, you know, mm -hmm. like it was eating on me. You know, I couldn't go back to this plant I was working at with the guys. If I'd have told them, man, they'd have, they'd have re ridiculed me and they'd have run me out of there. I'd you quit. lost your job, yeah. Yeah. So, you know. So you're describing you had a responsibility to carry over the whole story your experience right. and actually share it out to other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I just wanted to get it off my chest uh, and it felt better. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you got your naysayers and you got your people that's, that's had encounters and they know. Mm -hmm. You know, they can listen to somebody and tell. You know, once you've been there and you wore those shoes, mm -hmm. ain't no question about it, you know. Mm. Uh, Mike, I would like to understand with so much interest in Bigfoot Sasquatch, folks with a lot of enthusiasm, but maybe not very much real knowledge, are going off into the woods to explore for themselves. In many cases, they may be putting themselves into peril, real danger, and real harm. <coughs> Conversely, other folks are going into the woods that are hunters, <coughs> have military background or other, and are perhaps overconfident in going into the woods with hardware, with arms, thinking that they can both defend themselves and address any threat. If you were to go into 
a circumstance where you were actually being consulted on particulars, how would you address some of these issues of real security when it comes to Bigfoot? Well, first off, I would kind of know my surroundings, where I was at. Uh, and another problem that you could run into uh, these creatures, uh, they get certain areas that they, they hold up in. Mm -hmm. You know, different, several different types of families and they hold up in the area. Uh, but they have centennials out posted to let them know when somebody's coming or they're going to be trouble. That's where you can really get in trouble mm -hmm. when, when you get near you an know, uh, area like that because most of the time they got little ones. Uh, uh, far as protection, my sidearm would be a Smith & Wesson 500, it shoots a 500 grain bullet pistol. Uh, I believe I would rather use buckshot, I'd use a, a slug, but I would use a good, powerful 12 gauge slug. Correct. Uh, I bought some slugs made by Hornady, and they were like uh, 300 grains, and they were souped up pretty good. I thought they were bad. But a friend of mine down in Houston bought some slugs from a place down in Florida called Dixie Slugs. Correct. And I'm familiar. Yeah. And they were 900 grain slugs. Right. 900 grain and he also sent me some uh, uh, you know like your black powder rifles shoot the round ball they're 50s but well, he, he sent me uh, some shells that had there were 60 uh, grain uh, 60 cows and we had three of them in there yeah and I, I was just intimidated to shoot it I said yes. I don't know who's going to get the worst end of it, me and him. You know? Right, right. It's but true. If, if I was looking for protection, I would yeah. equip myself with something that, if it come down to it, right. and, and I need to get out of the woods, you know. And, and, and it was him or you? You, you, yeah. need, to, you need to think about that. So right. you're don't go out there with a 410 or a little, you know, right. 22 or something like that. Yeah. You ain't kill. So getting back to Louisiana, though, you know, my good friend, Kerry Arnold says this to people all the time, and he's he's right. You know, you look at the um, uh, the encounters that have happened on a U.S. map in Louisiana and Mississippi are sparse or vague. There's nothing there. Talk about a little bit first. You know, why do you think that is? here for Louisiana and Mississippi, and then we'll go into a little bit about uh, what you've experienced over your life as far as sightings, people that you trust, what they've told you, and this is all in our state, our local state of Louisiana. Well, you know, your first question, the, the reason Louisiana and, and Mississippi is sparse. Uh, if you look at East Texas, it's wrapped up all the way down. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And Louisiana's had got some counters, and so does Mississippi. But the problem is there. Uh, you take if you could add up all the people that's come forward, and that's a lot. Okay, on the TV shows and the radio shows, it's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But that ain't, that number's nothing compared to people that didn't come forward. Right. I mean, I imagine the people that did come forward out would go be five times more than that. Right. Let's come forward, right? Because they're afraid of ridicule, losing their jobs, you know, being committed, you know, uh, and, and a lot of people they just don't want the controversy. Yeah, you know, uh, they just don't want to have to every time they go out to the grocery store or wherever there's, you know, there's a crazy person, you know, they they don't they don't want that. Yeah. And, and another thing, your old people, your older people, they were bad about that. They wouldn't talk. I mean, you just wouldn't you really have to be in a family. I mean, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I just, I never really had one over to me. Right. You know, uh, I know my grandmother's, when they owned a good bit of land, she uh, she told some people some stories. They had some creatures out there on their land and how they would, uh, you know, come in a house and, uh, you know, way back then they didn't have electricity. There right. wasn't no electricity. Right. There wasn't no running water. Right. And you slept with the windows open, no screens. Yeah. And and uh, she, uh, my my uncle, it was he's dead now, but he was a little boy, about seven eight years old, and uh, she cooked bread, biscuits, and stuff, and she would leave them on the table on the deal at night. Mm. Well, the next morning they would get up and come in and it'd be gone. 
And then little kids, you know, my aunt was seven, eight, and he was seven, eight, and they'd ask him what happened to the bread, the biscuits, and my grandmother would say, well, the hairy people got them. Well, they didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. The hairy people the got hairy them? The hairy people got them. That's what she would say. Well, evidently, she knew something about these creatures. And, and this land that this happened on, their land, when my uh, grandfather come over from Texas and when you were, uh, uh, you could stake your land back then, 150, 200 years ago. Right. He had 10,000 acres here. Mm -hmm. And all that game reserve and all that was his. Mm -hmm. and my encounter happened four miles from their house. Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, uh, so uh, I know that they're there. Yeah. They're there. And it's been a fact like they've always been there. Always. Wow. And so uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, things out there that, you know, don't get told. But uh, there's a lot of things that do. Right. And uh, it's uh, uh, mind-boggling. Right. Mm -hmm. So what So what are some things that you could tell us, whether they're from people that you know, family, friends, people that you trust, or even yourself, what other sightings, what other stories really stand out in your mind to put Louisiana... So, somewhat as a, a, a squatch state where people just don't really know? Well, everybody asks me, uh, are they in every state? And I don't think they're in Hawaii. But the best I can tell, they're in all continental 48 mm -hmm. uh, in high numbers. Mm -hmm. Because I hadn't, I, I, there's one, I hadn't read about a state yet that somebody hadn't seen one or I had a rough encounter. So that tells me they're everywhere. Yeah, you know, it, it's just it, like it's just mind-boggling. Right, those numbers, you know. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people. A lot of people call me, you know, on phone, uh, Facebooking, and they tell me a lot about their encounters. You know, some of them pretty rough. You know, right. Some people get tormented, you know, at their houses. You know, and and, uh, and that's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, beating on the side of the house and, and looking in the windows, and well, that's just all typical. That happens. I guess they're just curious. I don't know what the deal is. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess they're just curious. They want to see. But I know I don't want something like that looking in my window to scare my kids. Yeah, exactly. Mike, have you measured or have you been able to keep track <laughs> of, I don't know, the frequency or the volume of reports that you've heard? Have they been increasing over the years, or well, is it just a response? They're steadily to increasing. Steadily increasing. Yeah. Uh, Why mean, do you think that is? I think the population is growing. Number one, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the uh, and you know when a creature you know when he's born and he gets a certain age, uh, the old the old dude in in the group he's going to kick him out. Correct. Right. And then you know especially if you know if he looks at one of the old dudes girls. You know, you're automatically out. And I think that's where a lot of the trouble comes, uh, happens. Uh, the one that uh, that I got into it with, he was he was built like a bodybuilder. He had no fat on him. He, I mean, he was bowed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when the old, old dude kicks them out, they're mad. And I think that's how sometimes you get a rogue male. You know, he's, he's, he's on the tear, he's mad, and he's looking for another clan to get in. And the only way he's going to get that clan, is he's going to take that old man out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's mad. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think that's where a lot of the trouble, uh, the, the real serious encounters happen when you run into, uh, you know, a cat like that. You know. Now, there are a lot of people out there that say, you know, all the technology that we have now today, and we still can't get them on film. We can't get an HD clear picture of the Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? Why? You know, that boils down to the question I've asked myself and asked people, what is a Bigfoot? Mm -hmm. Where do they come from? What are they? Nobody can't give me an answer. And that's the question there I've thought about. There come the pictures are blurry, yeah. you know? Uh, and, and these things are the masters of disguise, you know? Uh, they can blend in the woods, they can hide, you know, and I, I think uh, 
you know, somebody might take a shot at one behind a tree or something like that, you know. Uh, they can be looking at you and, and you blink, they're gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Do you think that, you know, I grew up hunting, a lot of us grew up hunting. You hear some reports from hunters, but wouldn't you think hunters would be the people to come forward to say they've seen something? So, uh, is it the fact that maybe hunters are not alert enough to know that something's happening, that they're there, mm -hmm. or, you know, they do know and they just don't say anything? I think um, they do know, and and some do talk, but a lot don't talk. But I tell you, some of the inter interesting people that I have talked to is people on trains, you know, engineers on trains. Mm. They see a lot of stuff, brother. Mm -hmm. They see a lot of stuff. That's very interesting because you don't hear that in people's encounter stories. We drive up and down the highways. Right. They drive through the woods. Yeah. Right. The Cut deep woods. straight through right, the woods, right, right. yeah. Right. It's true. Mike, have people been in their in their as 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 your profile has grown and people understand who Mike Woolley is and they reference you, whether or not they know you personally or not, but then find you via Facebook and all these other access platforms. Do they find comfort in just sh Ex approaching you or is it that something that they need to share with you for you to learn of their experience since I've been involved in this Bigfoot uh, ordeal as my wife called it yeah I have met some of the kindest sweetest people in my life mm. down hurt down hard good people I met great people and I met some people that undesired but uh, I've had people send me stuff all from all over the world, gifts, you know, uh, you know, uh, just want to talk and I talk and I listen because, you know, I like to learn, That's it. Yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and it's like I was telling y'all earlier, you know, like I said, a bought lesson's better than a free one, right. as long as it's not on your dime. Correct. You learn from somebody else. Correct. If you can. Now, I've had to learn a lot on my own mistakes and my own downfall. Right. And sure. it costs. It hurts. Sure. But, but I get ready to do something in life, whether it's going to, I'm going to buy a new car or I'm going to do this or that. I see somebody. I go to them and say, hey, buddy, how's that car? You know, how's that truck? You know, yeah. What kind of service you have? You know, is it a good deal? You know, I've always done that my whole life. Yeah. And it's all, you know. And it's always served you well. Well, you know. Yeah. Uh, I tell everybody like do that. Don't be afraid to stop somebody and ask them. You don't know them, right? Yeah, most of the people. It's the way you approach the person. Yeah, it is. You know, and uh, uh, you know, um, but yeah, uh, I've talked to a lot of people. You know, I've heard some some really good, interesting stories. Right. And my heart's really won out to some of the people. Some things they've had happen to them. Mm -hmm. Their cows getting killed. Their horses getting killed. Mm -hmm. um, and just tormented, and then I've, I've talked to some people that you know I kind of felt like they're uh, they were out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going back a little bit to after, I know you said it took you twenty years, 20 years. really before you came out. Was there a period in Mike Woolley's life where it was Mike Woolley, the researcher now, where you were going to look for him? Well. I really didn't want to do it. I didn't want to care. I didn't care to do it. But I had so many people contacting me and asking me to go out with them and do this, you know. And mm -hmm. some of them were good friends, you know. And and, and people are funny, you know. You know, yeah. you, you turn them down, they take that as a, a slight, like you're blowing them off. Yeah, sure. And, and I would go out and do stuff like that, you know. But as my health started getting bad, I had to have my hip replaced and six discs in my neck and everything. I just couldn't hardly get around. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's like this, you know, if, if something happened in the woods and I had to run or something, I couldn't run anymore. You know, I'd just be, you know, if I couldn't shoot him off, I'd be caught. Right. But uh, uh, it's, it's just not, uh, it's not, I don't know what to say about it. Uh, it. It just don't really, it's not interesting to me anymore because it took away my deer hunting. 
-hmm. And that was a big thing in my life. Yeah. And that was run. That was run at early age, twenty six years old. Mm -hmm. It was run. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't. I, you know, I mean, I just couldn't be comfortable in the woods no more. Mm -hmm. Do you find anything to replace it? I like to fish. You know, I ride a motorcycle Harley. You know, and stuff like that. You know, and uh, but you still miss hunting? Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, you know, I keep fooling myself buying that gun and trying to get ready again and everything yeah. like that. And I know uh, I probably won't do it, you know. Uh, but you got to have something to do. Right, you know, and, and I was talking to a friend and he said, well, if you go to Colorado, Montana, hurt hunt, man, he said, they got big splotches up there you want to deal with. And that's a big wood, you know. <laughs> well, you know what? My head is just sp right. spinning now. <laughs> yeah. Now, now you're we get 10 miles out from 15 miles out in the camp, you know, you have to ride a horse. 15, 15 miles of base camp, and you're gonna walk 10 or 15 from there. My God, mm -hmm. you two, you're four, five, six days out, you know, and if something bad happens, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, at least here I can holler, you know, somebody's gonna hear me at a house. Yeah, up, yeah. Up there, you know, it's, it's gonna be a, what was that movie, Deliverance, you know? Yeah. Man, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be had, they gonna be squeal like a pig, you know? Yeah, so, you right the fuck up there. <laughs> So you don't like that baby I, I, I don't squeal, well, buddy. You know? <laughs> no, yeah, I don't like squealing either. I don't think anybody does. What about? Um, I like reading about it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, had you had an, any other encounters or sightings after that here in Louisiana? Yeah, yeah, I've seen. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, I, I've seen creatures. Uh, I moved my deer stand after that happened the next year. I moved it to the uh, the uh, southwest, about seven eight miles. And that stand I was on was a ladder stand that day I had encountered. It was like a ladder and a seat with a V cut in it. You lean it up against a tree. Mm -hmm. I had a big logging chain tied around it, but it was made out of drill stem pipe. Right, it was home, so, somewhat homemade, right? Yeah, welded. Yeah. We welded it. It was homemade, yeah. about 10 foot, 12 foot tall. And it's what they drill oil wells with. Yeah. That's some tough pipe. Yeah, it is. Well, I got, I got a friend that two weeks after this happened, I didn't tell him, but he took me over there and showed me that place to hunt. And he lived two miles across the road from it. And so I asked him one day, I said, will you help me go get my deer stand over there? You know, and he said, well, I had a special way to do it. It was a heavy stand, but I would back my truck up to it. You know, there was a couple of trees I could get to back it up and winch it down in there. And he said, well, why do you need me? He said, you don't need me to go with you. You know, I'm like, please go, man. I ain't going by myself, you know. And, uh, he said, some happened. I said, no, no, no. He says, we, we went over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, here was that deer stand wrapped around that tree mm -hmm. like a vine. Mm -hmm. He said, man, this is drill stem pipe. How'd you do this? I said, I don't know. And he said, Mike, could you piss off? I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so he got to looking at it and he said, there's trees here and here. He said, you couldn't have got a truck in here. Took a chain to it. Mm -hmm. He said, this was done. Yeah, and I said, "Well, I don't know, you know." So, but at and, that point, you weren't ready to. I wasn't come ready to come out. Correct. But that was in 1981. Is he? He died. He had heart surgery in 2010 and died. And uh, his wife come to me and went off. She she follows all this bigfoot stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, "Man, I knew what happened. I said, mm -hmm. Really? Now, now this is coming out almost 40 40 years later." Right. She said, Wayne, that was his name, Wayne, he was my mentor. He's killed 50 point bucks before. And uh, he uh, he went home and told her. Mm -hmm. He said, man, you should have seen that deer stand. He said, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, he hunted over there all his life too. But I wish he was still alive today where I could just, man, just tell just, him. get talked to him and, and he'd probably tell me. Yeah. But he was the kind of guy, if you just didn't come out and say, hey, I'm going to talk to you, you know, it's between me and you, mm -hmm. tell me we're friends, he'd have done it. Mm -hmm. But I just wish he was alive. But, but he went home and told her that day. And that's a long time ago, so that validated my case. And and there was a guy uh, lived down the road, a black gentleman, and uh, he, about two miles from down the road from where that happened. And he and I could show it to you right in the BFRO. He he uh, contacted BFRO, and he said uh, he lived about 500 yards off Highway 171, and uh, straight as a crow flies up from my deal. And he took his little dog out one night to go to the bathroom, 
Mm -hmm. And he said this creature was standing next to his utility building out from his house and said it was about eight, nine foot tall because the ease of the building where it comes down was about eight foot and his head was up above that. So he said it was wet, it had been raining. And he said, I can't even smell it out of that close. He said it was staring at me. And so he went to his little dog inside, got his pistol, and he said he could hear it walking off. So that was two miles from where my encounter happened. Right. Mm. So I'll never forget. I told my wife, I said, read this. I said, now, you remember what I told you about my encounter? She said, yeah. I said, this is two miles from where I am. What did your wife think when you went back or, or when you eventually told her? Well, I told her when those shows were coming on. Yeah. And I still don't think she believed in with the shows. And and my son don't really believe. But uh Still? He's he you know, he hunts and all, but he got a bad motorcycle wreck and he can't do nothing no more hardly. Uh mm -hmm. but he's just one of them that's, he's gotta see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now once he sees it he'll say yes or for real. So he's one of them that's gotta see it. Yeah. Um and uh um she um she would tell me if you said so, I believe it. You know, well, that I wasn't comfortable with that. You know, I just, you know, but uh, when she started hearing all my friends and different people coming up and calling me and talking and TV and articles, she's, she's a believer. Yeah. And uh, a matter of fact, uh, uh, from my house one morning, we were going to the doctor about 10 years ago. And uh, we were about uh, north of Kicha, about two miles. And there, there was this property, it's, it's open, a big open piece of land on the left, and uh, I saw some crows, I looked over my left and I saw some crows about uh, mm -hmm. 70, 80 feet from the fence line. And you had some facing each other like that, northeast, and you had some facing like that, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, one of them, the crow that's on the east side, he turns and starts walking real brisk, aggressive uh, towards the east. And I'm like, what the heck? Well, there was a big uh, female standing there on the edge of the woods, mm -hmm. and she was real nasty. I mean, her hair muddy. I'll tell my wife, I said, look, look. And she said, yeah. So we went in, uh, she told my doctor, she said, man, I saw a big one today. So your wife saw it? She saw it. She well, saw it. we were coming back through there, it wasn't two weeks ago. She said, look, there she is again. Right. Two weeks ago? Yeah. From now? Now. So she saw it again? Yeah. And this land, uh, mm -hmm. these people uh, own it, it's a lot of land and they're very wealthy people you know, had a big yacht that sell around the world mm -hmm. and so I was talking to this lady she wrote books and uh, she said, you know, I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot, you know, and stuff like that and she said, I, I hear panthers hollering at night and everything, I said, ma'am I said, they can sound just like a panther crying right. and she said, you know, the fact is funny, she said, we got a nice size pond in the back of the place and we have a lot of trouble with black people sneaking there and fishing and we don't want nobody fishing because you know the liability but she said one day we heard some screaming back there and she said we, we, we heard people hollering and so we went back there to check and she said several she said I'm sure it was old black people they were fishing mm -hmm. and she said their rod and reels and their tackle boxes was all up the trees and their fish buckets was so down Fish was out. Right, right, and she right. said, for right. some reason, they left in a big hurry. Right, something's And so I'm saying, yeah, I kind of, I got a good idea. I know why they left. Right. That's crazy. We keep hearing, Mike, you're very, very, very practical. <coughs> you approach things square, sincere. You have a very grounded sense of how you're going to enter into something, even if you don't understand what you're expecting to come at you. I listen. And, and, and I don't know, I know when people people tell me on the phone, and I know you've told me before, they'll be talking to me on the phone. Mm. And I'll say, you there? You still there? You there? And you ask me, I listen. Yes. Because I'm taking all this in. Correct. And I'm, and I'm, I'm recording it, but I'm having it to digest it. You know, and, and, I, and I, I, I really think about it where I can lock it in my mind because I might think about it a week, a whole week. Mm -hmm. right. like, you know, what, what's going on here. Analyze try to figure, it. Try to figure reflect. it out. Reflect. Right. And uh, so I knew right quick, being a wet registered, what happened, you know. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a Boy Scout ranch 
above that land runs back all the way to uh, Kickapoo. It's about three or four thousand acres. We we passed it on the way. Yeah, on the way in. Yeah. And and so you know there got that land and, and it's all woods and and it's it's a good spot for some some bigfoots in there. But you know you hear stuff like this has happened mm -hmm. and you know people not visually visually seeing them. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it is, you know, but, uh, you know, all the screaming that was, you know, it sounded like a squash was hollering and some, some guys were hollering and tackle boxes and the rod reels up the tree, you know, all the gear was left, you know, she said it was just like it was just, I got an idea, you know, Why? somebody got spooked real bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I got some six, seven hundred dollar rod reels, I believe I had left them too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and bass, you know, Shimano's and G, -G sure, sure, sure. It was time to go, you know. I mean, right. man, you might be fish, you know. Right. Squatch is going to end up using them, you know. Well, you know, he's got good taste, right? Maybe. Shimano gear is yeah. pretty good stuff. He's one of those That's fish. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Remember what I told you? How they are? They're it's opportunists. Cane poles. They're right? opportunists, man. Like getting your chickens or or, or whatever right. they need. Right. They like it easy. Remember when we were talking on the phone? I think it might have been the first time. He told me a story of an old boy who had got under the truck and all. Yeah, I love Oklahoma. Tell it, it. Tell us that story because it's a riveting story that you tell. Um, just explain that story. Oh, I knew the guy, you know, and a uh, friend or yeah. Once every year, uh, there's like these three or four different sets of families. Uh, they would go to Oklahoma and deer hunt. They would take off the whole deer season, all their vacation time and all that, and they'd go up there and camp out from day one to the end. Right. And they were hunting back on top of a mountain and, uh, you know, had some switchbacks in it. And uh, it was down a road, uh, old older logging road, and it run all the way back and uh, to the end of the mountain, you know, and the rest was shooting straight down. And so, uh, they're camped out, you know, they got their travel trailers, and, and, and so one night, uh, uh, they're all around a campfire, got a big campfire built, you know, and he was t telling me that uh, they uh, had their trucks parked out away from the campers, you know, and uh, some of them had those tall four-wheel drives and stuff, and one of the guys had got a FLIR, mm. you know, mm -hmm. a FLIR, and he, you know, he and so, He's sitting around a campfire and somebody says, what's wrong? You know, he's just he's standing there, he look, he's just looking to the flare, he ain't saying nothing, he's glued, his eyes are glued to it. And he told him, he handed, he handed it to somebody and said, look under that truck. And they looked and said, it was a big squatch. And he was under that four wheel drive truck and he was watching him. And he right. was about 50, 60 feet away. Right. So who would have thought dark? Sure. He, could, he never would have seen him without that flare. Yeah. Because right. where the truck was set was dark. Right. And the Squatch, you know, he wasn't smart enough like, you know, to know that, you know, if he had a flare looking at him, you know. Right. And ain't no telling how long he looked at him where they found him, you know. God, being, it was under the truck spying on them. Well, sure. Mm. I mean, if one wanted to hide and you wanted to hide in any way that was even more deceptive? Wouldn't you hide in a way that yeah. was least obvious? Right. Not you know, thinking that there's you know, so much thinking going on. I've, just I've, saying, seen them, I've seen them in the woods before, and uh, if another hunter was coming through or something, they'd hug a tree. Right. I mean, they would get up against a tree, and if you blinked and you looked back, you couldn't find them. They just blend in, you know, and, and the colors, they just blend in. Right, right. Plus, staying motionless. Right, and they can do that. Right. I mean, they, they can they can stay motionless as long as they need to, and they're very <laughs> cautious in the woods. You know, when they're yeah. easing through, they travel. They're looking. You know, um, I've seen them before moving through the woods, and uh, uh, they would move up to a tree and go about thirty foot, and get behind a tree, and stand there. Mm -hmm. And if there was one with him. Back there in the back, he would do the same thing. When that one stopped, he would stop. Mm -hmm. You know, he might be 50 yards behind him and get behind a tree and hide mm -hmm. and stand there and look. Just scope it out. 
Right. And when the coast was clear, he thought it was clear. Right. He'd move up to another tree. But it just wasn't none of that. Just correct. I mean, it was stealth behind a tree right. and scope it out. And patience. And that's why people, well, why, can't, why don't they ever get shot and stuff like that? They're just too smart with that. We hear about that in a lot of stories, or a lot of encounter stories, about these creatures' patience. They may be a deer hunter on the stand and he's observing something, but whatever he's observing that he can't quite make out is apparently outweighing the hunter before anyone make, makes the next move. Right. What, um... Given your background, your encounter, what you've learned up until now, do you think Sasquatch is some sort of missing link ape or a hominoid species of some sort? What's your thoughts on that? First off, I don't think they're any kind of human. Mm -hmm. You know, they say that the chimpanzee has a certain a good highly percentage of a human in it, DNA. Right. Sure. I think what they are, I think down the line, I, I think they're just a, nor a great North American ape. Uh, you know, it dates from way back. Sure. And, and they didn't get, you know, real, you know, and there's some of them made it in the population group. But I think they've been here, here you know, the Indians, uh, have been here 400 years and they said the squatches were here before they got here okay so you know i think it dates back to you know when everything was early man right early, when everything was breaking down but i don't think it's no part of man i think they were just a part of a ape you know uh i've heard people uh, tell me that they're uh, 15 times stronger than a gorilla and that's pretty stout you know, a story about your stand being wrapped around a tree yeah. like it was melting. It, it might have took three or four of them. I don't know. Yeah. But but it was done, and uh, you know I had people contacting me here a while back. Uh, they wanted to go back there and find that stand and cut it up, sell parts of it. To sell it? To sell it, make money on it. Yeah. And I told them no. Yeah. And then and besides, they didn't log that. Yeah. But they were trying to make money off my back. Yeah. You know, you know, of course, cut me in, and you know. I've seen too many of them good deals, you know, and, and I just, that, that place just needs to be left alone. Yeah. So you don't actually just shy away from profiteering, but you don't really have any time or taste? I really don't care. Right. You know, I mean, I've made money in my life and done things, but I just don't, this is something that I've never really been interested in, trying to make money. That's it. You know, uh, I didn't want to make that movie. Yeah. Uh, I had this producer come to me, and and another friend, her friend, asked me to help Skookum, her. Right? Scoop them, right? Scoop them, yeah. Help me to ask, and then it just one of those deals, you know. And, uh, and and she'll tell you. I told her, I said, I'll help you make a movie, but I don't care if I can dime off of it. And oh no, no, we're going to pay you. And they promised me this and that, and this and that, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I, I never really tried to make any money off of this. Yeah. I've been I've been offered a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but. I've just seen too many deals fall through, and, and uh, you know, I just, uh, you know. If you could design an offer, meaning if somebody were to approach you and you could speak to them frankly, could you think of something that maybe you would like to achieve as far as this subject or this whole thing well, of investigation? Are you talking about making money? No, not really, but more to satisfy maybe some of your curiosity, or if... Well, you found something that you wanted to share out to others. Uh, well, you know, I have a tough thousand things that I could, I know that would make money if I wanted to do it. And, right. and this stuff. Uh, but, you know, it takes money, a lot of money. Some, it takes some it takes money natural money. investments. Yeah, correct. You know, I know a lot of stuff that would really do well. But uh, mainly I share with people when I do my radio shows, I just tell them, you know, if you're out there in the woods and you run into one of these things, I try to tell you how to get out alive. Yeah. You know, uh, because these things are uh, a loose cannon. Mm -hmm. 
And, and trust me, when they see you and their blood pressure, they don't tell them what aggressors. They get mad. They're they're very hostile, uh, and, and and they just they wig out. And and if you just make the wrong take the wrong breath, he's going to be on you. And you could do that very by easy. accident. Even. By accident. Yes. You know, and like I said, looking at them in the eyes and pointing at them, pointing guns and hollering and all. No, you don't do that. And, and you just got to you got to walk get out of there. You know, and watch your back. Right. And, and like when you go in, I tell you, watch your back. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of be observant. Be very observant. Uh, like uh, if you're in an area and you, there's it's dead quiet, no birds are singing, and there's nothing going on. Well, that's a big sign right there. Something ain't right. Yeah. You know, when the crows ain't calling and and and, and uh, all that. And uh, I've I've heard them imitate crows and owls and stuff like that. And you can tell. That's exactly what. That's exactly what he said too. Carrie said that. Correct. Yeah. And, and they can't get it down. They can't do a bird call. So it's know. mimicry. But so it's it's, not. it's almost like it sounds like someone trying to right. sound like right. an owl. They can't get the finish out. That's yeah. It's weird. You know. Uh, yeah. They they uh, they got all kind of signals. Right. You know that they they relate to themselves. Uh, but I would be very uh, cautious out there beating on trees and uh, doing those calls. Yeah, or even provoking. Yeah. <laughs> Let's speculate a little bit. <clears throat> Do you think a creature has has been shot and killed? Now I'm, I'm sure. You yeah. know, in time, I'm sure it's happened. Yeah. Um. How do, how do you feel about the whole um, we need a body to prove it? How well, how how would you how how could you prove it? It's going to take a body, right? That's but what I say. but it's like this, you know. Um, I've, I've sold timber before in my place, mm. made good money, but then I had to get dozers to come back in there mm. and get the stumps and clean it up, make it nice. So you could I didn't, I didn't make no money. Right. Yeah. So what are you going to tear up? What you're going to do when you prove it, you're going to put a fear in this country like you ain't never seen. The fishing industry, the hunting in industry, nobody's going to go back to the woods hunting no more. The travel trailers, the motor, people buy that to go camp and go out in the woods. They're not going to buy that no more. Those people are going to lose their jobs. They're going to have to dedicate so much land, like the oil industry, drilling these wells. and there are all kind of wells out here. I mean, that's going to die. The timber industry, what's it going to do to it? It's going to rock. This, this economy... It's gonna feel. It's it. gonna. It's gonna shock it. It's gonna be bad, and that's why the government. I still believe the government keeps it suppressed. Yeah. So, do you think it'll ever be known? Like yeah. in your oh, it's lifetime gonna happen. or my yeah. lifetime? I feel like it's gonna happen within the next 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I do. I really do. Do you think? Have you seen an increase in people's a awareness? They're wanting to get involved to become searchers, mm -hmm. researchers, scouters of Bigfoot. Like it, it, it just seems like there's been a resurgence of people looking for, for the creature yes. more so now than ever before. And I don't know that because you know you've been around longer than I have. It could have been going on. There could have been people looking back in your day but it seems now just it's at a massive height do you think so oh well yeah i know so um matter of fact i've spoke to uh, certain types of people this really showed a big interest in it and it blows me away it's women women yes women they're going in the woods by themselves you know and i've told them don't do that that's the most stupidest thing you can do, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, even though I'm out there in the woods and I got a big rifle and a bunch of them come up, I can't tell you what I'm going to do. 
Yeah. Because that time that I was frozen on that stand, I couldn't move. My body was just like it was just ice, mm -hmm. you know. And to say what they don't know, you know, they could do the wrong thing or not do the right thing. Yeah. And it's just not a cool idea. It's not cool for a man. I tell them, guys, don't go out there by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, take a buddy or two. You know. Well, why do you think perhaps maybe there's such an appeal, not just recently, but to go and explore and experience something that is so unknown and at the same time potentially dangerous? I don't know. I think it's the thrill. Uh, you know, I've got friends that skydive. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's. My daddy was in World War II and he loved it. Uh, he was a paratrooper and uh, he told me stories about when he would get down to the ground, the Germans would, he'd have thousands of holes in his shoes. Yeah. And a lot of those guys were dead when they got to the ground. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but he liked it. He loved parachute. He loved planes and, and jumping out of airplanes. Me, I don't. I don't even like riding an airplane. Right. You know, but, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, I think it's the, the, the thrill. Yeah, the adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. It's a game. I think that's the problem. I think the people, they're looking at this like a game, mm -hmm. a video game. Mm -hmm. but, but this ain't no video game. Mm -hmm. This is serious business. <clears throat> Here's one thing that him and I, and also Kerry Arnold and I like to talk about occasionally. You have, let's say we've been talking about this resurgence, right? People in the woods actively putting boots on the ground. Whether they're novice, whether they're veterans, they've been doing it for years and years and years. People are still out there trying to educate themselves. Sure, there's always going to be wahoos out there doing things that they're not supposed to do. Giving searchers, researchers, scouters a bad name, but it's generally a good thing, but other than a body, I don't know if that effort will ever be able to have a return. Even if I took this, this technology, mm -hmm. the, these cameras that we have, the digital cameras, and Sasquatch walked out, mm -hmm. and I got a clear shot zoomed in from knees up it was in the open and you got a HD or a 4k shot of this creature and recorded it for more than just a blink sure right but a nice solid stretch of yeah something you imagine something you, you as believers you you can't help but think of possibly seeing one day whether it's somebody else's footage or not. Even if you had that, they won't believe it. I still, th we still think it, it ain't worth the crap. It ain't worth the crap. I don't care. I've seen good footage, but right. I've got I've got footage. You do in my phone. You know, and and people say you know, uh, it's just true. And, and some of them are hid in trees. And since I know how to look for it, I can look. And I can show it to you until you show me that squatch. Mm -hmm. And you say, I can't tell you. But when I start taking, she'll point it out to you, show you this and this. And you say, yeah, I see, you know, I see it. Yeah. You know? You have to be taught. We have to be taught. And that's where a lot of people say, there ain't none in the woods. I've been hunting all my I've got friends that man, I've hunted all my life. I ain't never seen one. Right. Yeah, because you've never seen one. You know, I have uh, come up on them uh, back when I was squirrel hunting. Uh, I would hunt down in the creeks and the branches, the little branches, and you know, they were down 20, 30 foot down low, and the water would be down there, and squirrels would come down there, you know, and uh, uh, I'd pop them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, and before this happened, uh, my encounter happened, must have been two or three years, uh, I've come up on some big tracks in the sand, and uh, um, I got to follow it, and uh, the next thing I know, the tracks were gone. You know, so so they went, and, they and then they just gone. Well, and I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good tracker. And I, you know, hundred and on, and I knew I said he's here. You know, whoever made those tracks is here, and so uh, 
I got to looking around and I seen some muddy water coming down my way. I said, yeah, that's it. I know what you did. Mm -hmm. Got down the creek. Trying sure. to, you know, trying to walk a creek. Which is an old trick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's an old Indian trick, you know right. what I mean? And uh, so I got on up about another 150 yards and there was a round curve. You know, I, I got a real bad smell, you know. And so someone just told me I just called it off and went the other way. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, just stuff like that, you know. Fascinating. Oh, you know, it's just more, it's just what these creatures can do, their knowledge, their stuff, uh, the way they can, the, the way they can get around and the way they can camouflage themselves yeah. mm -hmm. and their stealth. That's how they don't get shot, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. And it's intimidating. I mean, when you get out there in the woods and it ain't like seeing these big, tall, seven foot skinny basketball players. Mm -hmm. well, you're looking at some eight, nine, ten foot and uh, 600 to 1,000 pounds. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that's, that's pretty so, intimidating. Yeah. The place that you had your stand, had that been a place you always hunted? Like that spot? Like for years and years and years? No. No. Uh, it was a brand new deal. It was a brand new deal. I think when that uh, encounter happened, I'd have hunted that stand five times. Uh, there was some uh, weird stuff that went on. Mm -hmm. um, I got back there one day about uh, three o'clock. It's a nice sunshiny day. and uh, Now that was about the fourth time. Uh, the fourth time uh, I was, I'd hunted the stand. And I smelled a a bad smell, mm -hmm. a dead odor, you know. And the first thing that hit my mind, uh, people were bad about uh, hunting off your stand and killing a deer, sure. and they would field dress it under your stand. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't do that. You yeah. don't gut a deer out on your, you, you, you're telling every deer in the country. Well, it's just bad form. You don't yeah. do it. Right. But they did that as a Correct. face. Well, that's what I thought. I, I mean, I got about 100 yards, I smelled, I said, somebody done killed a deer, and then, yeah, I, I, didn't was know mad. I was mad. Yeah. Right. I was mad. Out of spite. Yeah. Well, I got down there. Nothing. No, no, nobody killed a deer. Nobody been on the stand. And so I said, you know what? Uh, uh, they must have threw the guts out away from here. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to find them. Well, I started doing a circle around my stand, and I'd increase it. And I'd increase it. And I'd increase it. And I'd increase it. Man, I didn't. Must have went around 300 yards. You know, and I couldn't find it. You know, and I said, "Well, I looked up the air, see if any buzzards are flying. No buzzards." Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was a squatch that day. Mm -hmm. Did that, you know, and uh, because I didn't find no guts or, or none of that. Uh, but that was about the fourth time it happened, and then the fifth time is when I had that encounter. Yeah, it probably might have been the same one. I don't mm -hmm. know, but uh, yeah, I never did have a good feeling hunting back there. Uh, it was just like it, it's just you know that like that's... electrical. It was like electrical feeling going through you. You know your hair stood up like you know, mm -hmm. like you always had to keep looking back. You know you you've been like that before. You know yeah. and uh, yeah, I didn't have a good feeling, and uh, then that happened. You know, and uh, you know, rest is history. Mm. Obviously, you had that experience and an encounter to reflect on. But I'm hearing that when you actually go out to the woods, on a number of points here, that when someone needs to be aware, they need to be aware not just only visually, but by smell, right. and by their whole being. Whole being. Yeah. Very attuned to what's going on in the woods. Listen to the birds. Correct. And, and most of the time, even in the wintertime, I've heard frogs and crickets in the winter. People, you know. And, and, and when everything hushed up, gets real, real quiet. That's, there's a reason for that. Right. What do you think that reason might be? Why would even a frog respond to? I think, I think they're scared or it's a panic. I mean, uh, uh, you know, like uh, your crows, uh, all your birds, uh, they shut down. Yeah. And, and then uh, I've, looked at, I've looked at this. A lot of encounters, yeah. And every time, correct. That person said that's what happened when they had a blow up, when they had a counter, right. So, 
So this is a routine. This, this is a routine deal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's a warning, right. and that's what I tell everybody. You need to learn this stuff. Heed the warning. Heed the warning. Yeah. And and by all means, be aware. Mm -hmm. You know, just don't be out there trying around. You know, look be looking around and kind of watch yourself. You know, what, watch, what, watch for movement. Right. What do you what would you tell somebody who's actively searching, whether it's day or night? Uh, and they hear wood knocks in the area. Well, um, evidently it might not be another person doing it, but I would be very careful because that's a signal. And, you know, uh, that Bigfoot that, that did the knocks, he might think it's another one doing it and go meet up. I was, I've seen that. I heard that happen before. Mm -hmm. The guy turned around, he had a big one standing behind his back, mm -hmm. watching him. So, you know, you got to be careful what you ask for. Right. You might just get it. Do you um, spend time on YouTube watching watch, some yeah. of the stuff that's yeah, going on? Yeah, uh, I'm more of a, I guess you can call me an armchair researcher. Yeah. But, because, man, you know, you can, I can get off and stuff like that, and all my worries and all, man, I just, you can read, 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 and late at night I'll listen to the stories. Right. So, and I gotta go to sleep, you know. Yeah. And, and what What are some of the channels or things that you like to watch, or, or or do you know the channels, or do you just come across them and just actively suck in everything that you come across well, without listen, knowing? You know, I listen to some Bigfoot stories, a few stations I trust. Uh, yeah. And I like uh, South Louisiana and crabbing and stuff like that and crawfish. I like I watch all that stuff. And uh, you know, cooking. I love learn cooking and yeah. seafood. Yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. And uh, just uh, you know, just something to get off into. And yeah. you know, you can just go, go, go. You know, you know, everything else is just kind of right. And and I think there's a large percentage of people out there, whether they're an admirer of Mike Woolley or not, it's just an automatic feeling that they think you love Bigfoot. And I don't know if that's really the case. I think it's in. I don't. I'm not going to say I love Bigfoot, but I will say this: they are alive and well mm -hmm. in the forest, and I respect Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. You know, even though I don't love you, I can still respect you. Right. Sure. And so, when you get to where you lose your respect, it can you know, turn out pretty bad for you. Right. I respect these creatures because uh, I've been around them, I've seen what they can do. You know, trust me, if you can catch a wild deer and you've seen how they can jump and how fast they can move, yeah. right. you're, a bad, you're a bad sucker. Sure. Yeah. And they can do it. it it's, um, it's curious to me now, in our conversation, to maybe even just speculate because I don't know what other people are thinking or motivated by. But I'm getting the impression that many people perhaps are going off into the woods in search of Bigfoot or creature or experience, where in fact maybe they're really more interested in searching for something within themselves. It just happens to be that they're searching for it outside in the woods through this activity. But there's a much more of an interest perhaps and what maybe they discover in themselves. I'm curious what you think about that. Well, yes and no. Because I don't know what other people think, of course. You know, um, I've been in the Sam Houston National Forest down there, and, and that's where the Lone Star Trail goes through. Correct. And boy, I tell you what, um, man, I, uh, I went to a spot where that bow hunter was killed. Mm -hmm. And the police tape, tape is still there. Some animal killed him, you know. No doubt. No doubt. This yeah. happened recently? Well, not three, four years ago. Three, four years ago. Which is recent. Yeah. And 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 we were at parked at the end of the road. It was uh, me and a friend from here and uh, two other guys in a truck and another guy. And uh, uh, we was... Uh, uh, sitting down this old old road looking same road the bow hunter got killed on and uh, we uh, got it got it was getting late and remember basically we need to head on back to Louisiana you know that's a long drive yeah 
And so my other friends, uh, they continue to sit there. Well, uh, later on that night, I got a call. I said, man, y'all should y'all left too early. Mm -hmm. You should have been here. My, my friend's truck had loud pipes on it. I don't know if that irritated them. Mm -hmm. But when we drove off across the road, they said it must have been about 30 of them went off. Started screaming, just started screaming all, just lined up down that road. And there was some on the other side of them. And uh, they were they were pinned in. As a matter of fact, one of the guys got down on his knees. He had a pretty good sized pistol. And he's in the military. And he's getting ready to start throwing the lead. Mm -hmm. It got that serious. And they had to run out of there. Mm -hmm. And uh, though they were coming to them, you know, uh, and the way they could tell they were coming to them, they would get louder and louder. They couldn't hear them moving, but right. they'd get louder and louder. And With he, the screaming? Right, right. And so uh, there was they had a good, good many of them. And, and that's, uh, that uh, Sam Houston Forest is, is full of them. A lot of people come up missing. Well, a, a lot of stories come from there. Uh, not just harrowing stories, but sometimes casual stories. Families going off on, uh, I don't know. Certain holidays, just to take. A now I did go to a camp, so a campground there, uh, where uh, these people were camped out in a travel trailer, and they had like a twelve-year-old daughter, and she went back behind the trailer, or something, looking at something playing, and that was about two weeks and a half before we got there, yeah. and that kid come up missing, they never found her. Jesus, that's happened a lot. It, it's it's not just the warning. Wes Germer went down there. Oh, he did? Yes, sir. He went down there and, and, and get him to tell you about it. In he, Sam Houston? Yes, sir. With some friends. He got the crap scared out of him and he said, I'll tell you what, the ones in the south down there don't play. He said, them squashes don't play. Right. Wes Germer said that. Yeah. Because they're, what, what? say it, they're uh, uglier. Ugly, nasty, and mean. Yeah. <laughs> Here in the South. <laughs> That's what we get a lot. And my contention is it's like, why does it have to be in Louisiana? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm having to smoke too much dope. All these people got these marijuana patches, you know, they get right. that. So there's a real physical cause for that. <laughs> it's not just a reputation. Oh man, they'll eat your they'll eat your uh you know, your uh Mary Jane up, you know. It's not just the public school system to blame. Okay. Oh goodness. Oh, the water quality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could run them all to Canada. You know, I just wish I could start down on the Gulf Coast uh, and start herding them, man. Just herding them, herding uh, them, herding them, herding uh, them. All, get about, all of them. You know, the northern people think they know it all. So I feel like it'd be good to let them have them all. Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, there's something of a bias, maybe, that the perception is that things in the South on many subjects are not quite up to snuff or right. certain quality or a certain degree of polish or finish or sophistication and now we're talking about a phenomena that you know it's very controversial and arguable but do we even have attitudes about these creatures in the south being sort of dumb and stupid and slow compared to the creatures in the north I mean, that's a ridiculous question. I've had people tell me that the creatures in the Pacific Northwest, which you got to realize they got bigger woods up there. They got woods people had not been in. Sure. And uh, they say that uh, they're not as uh, aggressive. They said, man, y'all are crazy down there. They don't know what's wrong with them. You know what I mean? They, Why is that? I don't know. I think uh, uh, that place I was telling you about, uh, I went to with a friend. He showed me those creatures, you know, it's, with this other place. Yes. Yeah. yeah. These things were, uh, a lot of them were three-toed. More like a skunk ape. They were three-toed and... And, uh, and it had a weird heel? Weird hands, yeah. Now, I kind of, I looked at like, well, that's interbreeding. Yeah. Because that goes with anything. You interbreeding, even human, something's gonna be wrong. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, then I had somebody tell me, no, mm -hmm. that was a skunk ape come up from Florida and, and had, uh, a, a dance with one of y'all's big boys, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what I said, well, whatever. But, um, you know. Who knows, right? So Who these knows? are interesting speculations, but. Right. I mean, everybody's got 
the, some sort of idea take I right. need, exactly and really the there's no book written whether you're Meldrum or Wooly or me there's no real book well that's why we're so curious I can't help it yeah and I'm so glad we got to meet Mike there's so much more to cover and there's so many more yeah even not just speculations, but real ideas based off of all the material that we have to take in and listen to. And it's this human narrative often that is really so intriguing because we're not hearing these stories through text, newspaper reports, television reports. We're hearing them through first person accounts. Yeah. And they're striking home because I think it resonates with people to hear a story from another person. Yeah. Well, another thing um, I've noticed the last 20, 25 years, uh, they're starting to come out of the woodwork. You know, it really wasn't that bad 25, sure. 30 years ago. There was a few encounters, but now it's just like, they're, hey, here I am. Right. They don't even try to hide no more. It's like they want, it, want you to see them. A bolt. And, and, and I've had a lot of biblical people tell me, if you read the Bible, it says in the end times, you will see the creatures mm -hmm. that will make you pass out. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you know the country's in a bad way. Sure. Yeah, and, you know. And, and it's screwed yeah. up. There's a lot of stuff going on. People fighting each other. I've never seen nothing like this. Yeah. So, yeah, that's made me think a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. You know? Um, Scary. But I've had a lot of scholars, Bible scholars, tell me, or y'all Catholic? I'm, I'm Catholic. He's Catholic. Catholic. Yeah. Read the book of Enoch. Correct. Yeah. That it speaks of that. Mm -hmm. About these creatures. Sure. They're in there. Hmm. You know. Well, that's a reference. Yeah. Uh, we, we're open to it. We're not trying to... Uh, critique it. Uh, you know, at the same time, we're also trying to structure our conversation even to try to learn what Mike Woolley thinks. I've had the Indian people, uh, I really learned a lot. Mm. Uh, I had this one Indian lady tell me one time, she said, uh, you know, you see all kind of different colors of their eyes. You have some that's green, you have some that's red. Mm -hmm. And she said, any time at night you see some uh, green eyes, she said, he's pretty, he's pretty much okay. He's pretty cool. Nice. But she said, if he's got red eyes, he's cannibal. Nice. Mm. And, you know, those right. people live with those things. Right. You know. Well, and, you yourself, not just because you've heard this from someone directly, but you actually respect that. Right. You give weight to that. Because I know this person knows their heritage mm -hmm. and what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, I respect that. Mm -hmm. That's what I was talking about earlier. I respect that because you're not, you know, what makes me mad is somebody tell me a lie. Sure. And then I go tell y'all this story. And it's right. a lie. Yeah. And I'm lying to y'all. Correct. But that really gets under my skin. Yeah. People get killed on kind of, kind of crap. Right. And, uh, but yeah, uh, I've learned a lot of good, good stuff, you know, about different things and, Met a lot of good people, a lot of good folks, mm. and uh, but it's it's uh, it's mind-boggling. I mean, it's just uh, I don't know. It's something you can't get a book, no, and read about and study up on it, no, because there's nothing there about all these things. And the science says they don't exist. Right here, right. and I said, well, I, what's the alternative? Just picking any place in the woods to go. I mean, what better place to pick, right? And I just found that odd that he was worried that there might not be any squatches there. Yeah. Which, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, there might not be any squatches. number one. But are, are there squatches just anywhere? No. I, I don't know that. What, what I would look for, number one, is food. If there's no food there, there ain't gonna be no squatches. What kind of food? I mean, we know there's deer, there's water, turkey, the squirrel, there's waters, and all of our wildlife. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, an opportunistic food, right? 
Right, even trash uh, perhaps. Right? And, and you know, and I can tell if squash is in an area, especially if I'm deer hunting, because if they're in an area, you ain't seen a deer. Those deer are gonna be gone. You're just gonna be hunting dry air. Because they feel the pressure. Because they feel the pressure and they get out of there. Right. And, um, uh, but yeah, squash, he's gonna get a place where it's, uh, he's got good concealment, he can hide, and, and food, you know, water, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, um, there were some people telling me a deal that happened down there that right there, going in New Orleans, there's a, a I don't know if it's before you get to um, Interstate 10, but there's a, a, a tourist place there, kind of big deal mm -hmm. on the right. Keep talking. It's we'll, pretty. We'll let you know. It's real pretty. It's got some dips and like that. It's a tourist deal where you pull in and go use the bathroom and do all that. Okay, so like a rest area off there. Yeah, it's town. a rest area, but yeah. it's somewhere down there near y'all, near the mm -hmm. And And uh, this guy was working there one night, and uh, he told me, no, that he wasn't working. He got off work, and he was leaving, and it was around 12 o'clock, something like that. Mm -hmm. And he said he saw one uh, right there across the road. And he had a deer over his shoulder. And he went up his embankment and went on. Right there at that rest area. Mm -hmm. God, I'm dying to know where that's Which at. is a very casual place to be. I mean, anyone stops in because they yeah. have to. Because they have to. You know, you know and what, what you know bothers me, running into them out in the woods is one thing, but you know, they're coming up to people's houses, you know, now. Right. Oh, that, that bothers me. Well, you mentioned already that they do approach people's homes because of curiosity, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they, they steal the food, like if you leave food out for dogs or cats, they'll take that. Right. You know, got corn for the horses. Easy, corn. easy Stuff food. that they can get, you know. Yeah. Steal corn out of people's deer feeders and, yeah. you know. But, you know, they can't, they want to get them a deer, that ain't no problem. I think it's remarkably, I, I mentioned earlier, that I think it's terribly risky for a creature to approach a home whether or not they're aware that the people inside do have or don't have weapons and all this other sort of thing. But just to expose oneself. Yeah, if I live... Because you're so curious? If I live rurally like I did before, I would have lights everywhere. Um, those uh, lights that uh, pop on when you trigger them. Yeah, that motion right, sensors. That's right. better because they don't know when it's going to happen. Right. As long as he thinks he's got it figured out, you got a light that stays on all the time, he knows that. He knows yeah. where he can get out. Yeah, I had friends that had them on the tops of their houses, and they took and unscrewed the bulb to yeah. to to counteract that or yeah. knock it off. Right, break it, break it. So, you know, if he don't know, he knows there's light over there somewhere. It might come on. He don't know where and when. Right, he will probably come around. But I've had people tell me to string Christmas lights out. Right, around the place, you know, and and that keep them out. And I know game cameras work pretty good. To keep them away. Keep them back, you know. Yeah. Keep them backed off. It's amazing that the game camera is a repellent. So it's that that infrared, yes. that infrared beam, you know, and yeah. they can see or something. Right. Yeah. Apparently they're sensitive that way. Yeah, and they don't, they won't, you know. Won't come near it. Well, I mean, in these stories, <laughs> these encounters, and all of what we're taking in, we often hear so many of these things that we start building a pattern in our own head because we are listening but um, people that are so enthusiastic about this subject are often just thinking very logically about these things and part of our conversation was to myself even stop thinking logically about so much of this because I wanted to start thinking rather than just being logical they're interested in food, they're interested in shelter. They're, yeah, that's a very logical sort of criteria. I'm also curious about, not whether or not they exist per se, but the nature, the characteristic of these creatures. The, the uh, meaning, after being a hunter, I start to get a feel for the game, for the deer, for the quarry, for the woods, for the, for the seasons, for the, uh, you know, I can go into a pond when I'm fishing and I'm like, you know, the fish aren't doing right here. It's not good. We ought to go to another one. And in the marsh, we'll traverse on to another one and somehow, redfish, the speckled trout. You look at that point, you see what's going on with the tide. 
And when, sometimes yeah. I'm right. They seem to respond better. I don't really it's nothing explain like that. that well. Yeah. But that's not being logical. Right. The first pond told me something, and I was sensitive to it. I went to the second pond. It seems to corroborate what I was feeling. I'm curious about these creatures in the same way. Right. But I don't have a lot of experience to operate on. But it seems to me, approaching this phenomenon logically is not going to be very, very and productive. And carefully. Carefully, sure. Um, we want to be careful. I have friends that um, uh, I have told them they need to chill out because uh, they take this stuff too serious. Mm -hmm. They live for it. In it's what like, way? It's their hobby. Yeah. yeah, going out, standing with, chasing these things, spending gobs of money, and time, and time, right. and could get killed, and and you know, and and, and they get fights with other other researchers about who's seen this or you didn't see that or he didn't see this or he's lying. And I mean, just ruin good friendships, just yeah. long term. Well, that sounds and, like but, a lot of. But it's a hobby, sure. And I don't understand that. Right. Um, I don't like. Uh, uh, you know, when I deer hunted, I know that deer could kill me with that rifle in my hands. You know, he gored me, he got me down, gored me, he could, yeah, but but that ain't gonna happen. Right, right. And and, and I knew what to look out for in the woods, the creatures, sure. the wild animals. And you, you had know. that empirical And experience. I go fishing, there's not no deadly fish here that's gonna, you know, right. kill me. N Nessie's not gonna come up and bite Mike Woolley and take him back underneath the water, right? Right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, that so, happened in our movie. Right. He did it. <laughs> he got Meldrum. He got Meldrum. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Oh man. So I don't want to be too logical about so much of this. Not well, not, not without being also cautious or aware. Well, be cautious and and, and take your time. Yeah. And study everything. And let it let it soak in. Don't believe what you hear the first time. Okay, yes, sir, sir. You know you'll learn the person, and you, and, and, you know other people. You, you, you know it'll come out and wash. Right. You know, and I, I can't tell you some of the stories I've been told because I'm just too embarrassed. I mean, I mean, I bet. I mean, it's just. I mean. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> man. Oh goodness. Now let me ask you this. Are there areas up here available to go research? Not really. Without being, no. I mean, it's private land. Back when, back when I had that encounter and when I uh, uh, hunted, the land, all this land is on my the timber companies in the northwest, Georgia Pacific, so, uh, Boise Southern, uh, all your big companies will, will have a warehouse. They own the land. Yeah. Well, back then they would let us hunt on it free of charge, as long as we didn't tear up no trees, driving nails and stuff. Right. And that's the way we did. But they started leasing the land out to hunting clubs. Right. And now there's posted signs, and these suckers, these guys, they shoot you, man. I mean, they, they, they take them, the hunting land serious. Yeah. There's yeah. nowhere to go. Yeah. We don't have no big national forest up here. I know. Well, I mean, we have the Kasachi. Yeah. And Fort Polk and, you know, and, the and, and that's, that's the one I meant to tell you, Kasachi, that's where those soldiers Sure. Run into yeah. uh, those at night. Right. And uh, you go down there, uh, there's caves everywhere. Where at? Right? Kasachi. And, and I know I went in a cave down there one time and, and they were they were using that cave because uh, it smelled real, it stunk real bad and there was hair in it. Mm -hmm. And I'd been down, I went down to a creek and I saw that it was sand and I saw the tracks where they'd been standing and all. And uh, yeah, they got some, they got some big boys down there too. I've hunted in Kasachi and I had no inkling whatsoever. It wasn't even on your radar. Well, and if it was, it wasn't in the in the apparent way that I should be applying any attention to it. Yeah. You're a bunch of wild hogs too. Yeah, there's other things. Plus, I could be off two ridges beyond where I'm camping and twist an ankle and be in a world of hurt. So there were lots of things on the... That's uh, really tall draws and ridges down there, too. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Do it, you know. So that's, that's what I just said. Don't ever do nothing by yourself, yeah. you know. Well, when you're young and, you know, yeah. you're 
bulletproof. So yeah, you know, supposedly. Uh, <laughs> we like Trump. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, um, do you have anything else you want to just happen to tell or include on yeah. the video? Most of it I couldn't put on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to be getting some great stuff in a little while. Sorry, folks. <laughs> um, well, Mike, man, we appreciate you coming. I mean, you got, do you have anything else? I mean, I'm sure there's going to be another visit, a part two, because well, I know the minute we leave, the minute we turn the camera off, I mean, it's getting late. Sure. Uh, Mike's got a wife waiting for him. Um, it's been a long evening. Yeah, it's been a long evening. So, there's going to be a ton of things I know tomorrow when we're driving home that we're like, why didn't we ask him this? Why sure. Why didn't we ask him sure, that? Sure, sure. Um, but generally, um, I mean, it was a good sit down. It was a good sit down to pick Mike's brain on Sasquatch. Well, I, I just have to offer, or really extend, this real promise. I'm absolutely listening to you. And even if maybe our questions are a little bit clumsy, and not they necessarily they elementary, very, very good. we really are listening. And if we have another meeting, which I'm very confident that we can prepare mm -hmm. something, that we would like to continue with maybe even these same questions. Because I'm, I'm confident that if we keep digging or pressing, there's still something that's going to turn up that we're not expecting. When you, when you all come back, I'll have you some uh, other people, a couple of friends. That I know some more people too, that maybe two sets of different people you could talk to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll listen to them just the same. Yeah, and and, and they're they're this is they're honest. They're they're truthful. Cause, you know, uh, uh, some of these are kin people, mm -hmm. and uh, they've been having some problems. And uh, it, where my encounter happened was about four or five miles mm -hmm. from that area. So even living. since 1980, 81, yeah, 81. They're having trouble now. This place is still like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it all gets back. I told you my grandpa owned all that land. Sure. And all my relatives was down there. His brothers. Yeah. You know, and over hard times, time bad, he had to sell a lot of land out. And he sold it to his brothers. He said, you know, sell it to the family. Yeah. And so, um, uh, most of them died off and they just kind of let the uh, state of Louisiana come in there, you uh -huh. know, and, and yeah. make a game reserve out of it. Right. But, uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, all kind of history down there, and you know, uh, I'll get you some phone numbers if you want to awesome. call. And then in the meantime, we're going to do some research on saving and wildlife management area as well. You know, any of these things by name, we're curious about. And what and what was the other spot that you said was heavy in paranormal stuff? La, Lavone, Goldana, Goldana. Yeah, Goldana. Goldana. It's Goldana. Goldana. Uh, we'll check we'll check that out too thank you man it's been awesome enjoyed it we're humbled we're glad you came i hope i didn't scare you too bad no welcome back i hope y'all enjoyed that interview with mike we had a great time uh we fixed mike steak dinner we had some good some good uh discussions dialogue some good spirits um, and some great chats and, uh, wish that the, uh, uh, uh the camera could have kept going. Cause once we turned the camera off, we started chatting even deeper, uh, about an hour more, but, uh, it was really enlightening. It was fun. It was great to meet Mike. We we're going to go up there and meet him again. There may be a part two with Mike Woolley. It all depends. He's got some stuff in his queue that he's busy with, Bigfoot related. Uh, that's coming up, so stay tuned. But um, just real quick, an update on Bigfoot Explorer YouTube channel. Just want to let you guys know I'm structuring the channel where um, I'm going to have playlists set up for the categories of videos that I want to do. There's going to be, of course, the Bigfoot scouting missions, which are out in the field, that'll be one category. 
Another one will be the Bigfoot technology or tech. And that's where we'll talk about, you know, all the gadgetry that goes along with uh, searching for these creatures or studying them, um, whether it's camcorders, still cameras, audio uh, recorders, um, flashlights, uh, software, um, just all kind of things. Plus, if you guys have any recommendations on technology videos that you can think of that you'd like me to look into just write down in the comments below some ideas or recommendations that you'd like to see um, wrapping up the technology there's of course going to be the Bigfoot interview category and then we're also going to do an unknown um, that may lead into other cryptozoology uh, facets so to speak we'll see i'm still structuring the channel um what i can tell you is the next video for bigfoot explorer is going to be a bigfoot tech video we're going to do a camcorder versus a digital slr when it comes to actually going in the field and searching and scouting for bigfoot which one's better camcorder or a digital slr style that camera for video, for photo, pros and cons for each one, and what I personally use and why. Um, so that's coming up on the next video. I'm um, going to go ahead and end it here. Leave any comments or questions below. Remember to hit that bell. Subscribe and like, please, and share. And we'll be back as soon as we can with that new video. Thanks for watching.